Hello, I'm at Hernhill Velodrome in South London for one of their midweek track sessions. You can see the guys and ladies on the tracks behind me. This is their um, veteran and woman session. This is where Sir Bradley Wiggins um, came to learn his craft uh, when he was that kid from Kilburn that he liked to talk about all those years ago. And it's still the heart of London cycling, despite the, the, the beautiful, wonderful um, London Velodrome a few miles away in Stratford, which um, is a much more modern affair. Um, this still has a very important role in London cycling. Um, and I'm here today to have a chat to someone who, um, I hope he won't mind me saying, but is a bit of an institution himself in uh, cycling. Ned Bolting um, is one of the legends, really, of uh, cycling broadcast, of cycling media coverage in general as a writer as well. So he's out on the track at the moment. He says it's been a couple of months since he's done it. So um, he said he's dreading having to push through that pain barrier. I am being a total chicken by watching from the sidelines, but um, we'll see how he gets on and chat to him a little bit later. So unfortunately, the brand new lovely pavilion at Hearn Hill isn't open today. So we've re relocated down the road to a lovely cafe in Dulwich. How did you find that this morning, Ned? You were dreading it by all accounts. <laughs> just ridiculous. <laughs> It's just so hard. You look around, you think we're all blokes in our 40s and, you know, and a, few, a few women, and the women are by far the strongest riders, really, in that, in that group. And you look around and you, you think, he looks a numpty. He looks like he's an accountant. He looks like this, that and the other. And a lot of them I know, and you think, how fast can he be? But then it comes back to that amazing thing that's very deceptive about cycling at any level, in that it's, um, it's all relative. Unlike any other sport, you know, you, I think, I mean, I've never been any good at tennis. I've got no hand-eye coordination. Darts, I play a bit, and I'm hopeless at it. So I know quantifiably how bad I am at darts and tennis and all those things that require actual skill. Like that. So, but the cycling, because nine-tenths of it is just turning the pedals, mm. you, it lulls you into that sort of sense of, oh, I'm, I'm cracking on here, you know. <laughs> I'm kind of like, I reckon, mm, you know, it's that whole thing about, I reckon I could probably put me in the middle of the Tour de France peloton in a, you know, an average, probably hold my own. And of course, nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> but because it's not obvious, you know, it, it, it always your mind plays tricks on you. And it played tricks on me this morning. And where I used to occasionally finish, occasionally third or even second or even won a race a couple of years ago, now I'm solid 20th. <laughs> and it's quite, hum it's quite humbling because it's going to be a long way back from there. <laughs> Is there a way back no. then? <laughs> no. Just a slow slides towards the grave ever slower <laughs> and what i'm dreading is now because this session has become it used to be just wednesday mornings the three r's right it explains rich redundant and retired um it used to be just wednesday mornings quite famously but beca become so popular over the last couple of years i mean literally the numbers have swollen so they can't accommodate everyone now they split it into a faster group on a wednesday and a slower group on a thursday and now I'm, I'm hovering between <laughs> wednesday and thursday and i'm just holding on to the wednesday group like that <laughs> And I know that I'm going to have to switch to Thursdays eventually, and that's just, I might as well just... <laughs> Hang on, I was down. trying to start on the Thursday. <laughs> yeah, but if you start there, that's yeah. all right. You, you yeah. aim for the Wednesday group, <laughs> aim for the stars. But I started in the Wednesday group, and now, you know, I'm like, I'm like, um, I'm just dropping down the divisions. It's awful. Do they all know you as Ned Bolting off the telly? They, they... <laughs> they, does, that, they does, do that, they, does that make it um, more humbling when, yeah, when and, you... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, because, be. yeah, I mean, they do, they do, they're, bless them, they're really, they're a nice bunch, but they do pick their moments to kind of pick you up on the pronunciation of some Belgian rider, <laughs> or tell me that I got some hopeless call wrong on the Tour de Yorkshire or something like that, and they'll, they'll, they'll pick that, you know, you know, kind of five laps into a <laughs> ten lap scratch race just to ride up alongside me and put me right, and I'll go, <laughs> what can we save this conversation for another time? <laughs> But um, they're just a lovely bunch. They're just nice folk. And there are some fascinating biographies there. And some, you know, it's mixed up with newbies like myself. I'd still put myself in that category. And people who have been coming down there. There's the old boy Roger, he's in his 70s. You know, he's been coming down there for decades. And um, grew up in Dartford, I think, Roger. And so, and so, yeah, it does, it kind of like, it's the past and the present of cycling come together in that group, actually. It's good, it's good. You still put yourself in a newbie category. Is that because you came to the sport in a very publicly outsider way? Will you ever see yourself as anything else? No, because um, you know I know that I've been a, kind of involved in this sport now for 15 years, which I suppose is quite a chunk of time. But you know, even 20 years from now, if we're still having this touch wood, I'm still here and we're having this conversation. 
um, I'd still consider myself a newbie because because of the particularity of the time in which I suddenly became involved in the sport. And, and the reason I think it resonates with people is because a lot of people in the Anglo Anglophone world, and particularly in the UK, made the same discovery at the same time. And, uh, and so that is a, that's a marked point in the development of cycling in this country where everything changed, I think, for better and for worse. Certainly got bigger in certain respects, other little bits shrunk, but it kind of there was a paradigm shift at that particular point, and it just so happened that's when I parachuted in. And so that is the new gen that is the new cycling. You know, would like it or not, and actually I kind of rail against it, but that's the point at which I joined. So I will always be a newbie, I think. Do you see, do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, completely, because I came in later than you did, but, but just a few years, yeah. Just a yeah. few years yeah. later, and yeah, similarly feel. Um, I always feel like an interloper. It's slightly different for me because I don't um, get to be an, as involved in the sport as you do, but I always feel like I will always be someone from the outside. <clears throat> for me, I find a, a sense of regret about that. Do you? Do you regret that you can't wear those old school badges and flaunt your stripes from years and years ago, or, or does it matter I, anymore? I, I, complete, <coughs> I completely know what you mean. I do, I do resent it almost mm. and regret it. Mm. Um, it's, it doesn't make much sense, does it? It's illogical because, you know, things always happened before your time. You know, that's kind of the nature of the chronology of the world. It's quite basic. But, but it kind of particularly applies to cycling. And, you know, weirdly ending... Uh, you know, I remember when I was first approached about switching my role and going into commentating and replacing Phil Liggett, which was a huge decision that I had to take. Um, one of my real reservations, and they were multiple reservations, it took years for them to persuade me, was precisely that point. I, how do I, how can I claim to have the history and the heritage? How can I, when we got Pralou in the, you know, how can I claim to draw down on the memories of Merckx that I've only ever read about or looked on up on YouTube? That says there's something bogus about that. Mm. And, and um, I, I don't think I should beat myself up about it, but I, nonetheless, there's an inherent sort of like uncomfortable thing about, about dipping into someone else's history because mm -hmm. those you know I, I'm very very aware of the fact that I'm still broadcasting and you're still broadcasting to um, a block of people for whom this was their childhood this was second nature to them and it's not this not the case of me so I don't know insult or tread on their memories um, and impinge on that side of it however you know with each passing year you know when I talk about let's pluck a name at random Carl, the Carlos Sastre uh, Tour de France win mm -hmm. And Alp Duez and the Schleck brothers and um, and and uh, Cadell Evans. Uh, uh, that's my history. Mm. I do remember that, and I remember being there, and I remember talking to the riders afterwards. And you know, year on year, as that as that past telescopes back again, you look at the pictures of what is it, 2008, wasn't it? Was it 2008? Yes. Yeah, um, you even even now, it's, it feels so recent. But actually, watch those footage now, and it feels like already that's a bygone era. And so, you know, the, the layers of history sort of pile up very quickly, don't they? And, uh, and, so, and so I guess that kind of slight imposter, that feeling of being a slight imposter will diminish as time goes by, but never entirely leave me, I don't think. I, I mean, there is that snobbery in any sport, I think, but um, I hesitate to say particularly in cycling, but it is one that is completely steeped in history. But we do have a responsibility i feel as well to bring new fans to the sport and so is it not a good thing maybe sometimes as well that you have an awareness of what that feels like to be to have that imposter syndrome but to, to welcome and embrace the new <clears throat> fans to the sport at the same time i mean it's something that i've been taught to be very conscious of working particularly on particularly on the tour de france and i have to say particularly for a free to air channel like itv that just by the nature of being a free-to-air channel, it attracts the biggest audience. Um, uh, you know, it's always been a it's been drummed into me since I first joined the team that we have a, a twin responsibility that often conflicts. Mm. One is not to insult the initiated, but on the other hand, always to you know extend a welcoming hand to what is a very complex and arcane sport um, to to the viewers. And you know, year on year, that has the kinds of questions that I would have normally grappled with by first-time viewers seem to have changed in nature. I mean, when, you know, for years and years when I started, going back to 2003, 4, 5, 6, the Armstrong years and then the subsequent years after that, the, the, the one question that would always get asked would be, if Mark Cavendish is so fast, why doesn't he win the Tour de France? Which I, is a silly question, but also it's an entirely understandable question. And it actually took me years to be able to 
instinct very quickly answer it because I used to have to think, yeah, it's a good question. Why is that? You know. <laughs> um, but people don't ask that anymore. Mm. That's so stopped being a question that's being asked. You still get questions that every now and again I'm asked that really take me back, and I think, crikey, there are still people for whom this is a complete foreign language, and that's a good wake-up call actually. I, I uh, oddly, I think there have you know when I first started to commentate, um, one of the criticisms that came my way occasionally was that I was too too technical, too engrossed in the minutiae of tactics and team, team, you know, the way that the race was actually being ridden, and actually didn't talk enough about the basics. Um, possibly because I was trying to prove to myself that I, I was worthy of calling a race. But, you know, I, I, I do need to be aware that if you watch a bike race for the first time, you have not the faintest idea what's going on. And I kind of, I have to, I have to replay, to, I mean, you know, that, from my first experience of bike, I did not know what was going on from start to finish. And it took years for me to even begin to understand it. Really. I was doing a better job of, of explaining that now, because it is something that any of my friends or family who, who, who don't share my passion for the sport, that their argument is always, I just don't get it. I just don't, they'll watch a bike race yeah. and they'll watch ours of, well, they won't watch it. <laughs> they yeah. would see ours of, of just yeah. men, Peddling. More and I, woman, thankfully, but just peddling and peddling and peddling. Yeah. I, I, well, it's is, that, that, a bit of that's true, right? Yeah, that, it is. That is, that is but, kind of true. So, some part of me wonders: well, is that entirely the responsibility of the broadcaster to explain everything, or is it just you know what you're either sucked in by the sport or you're not? You know. Um, yeah, but, but but then you need a, you need someone to. Exp I think you need a, you need that say that extending hand of welcome mm. to say actually, you think that's just a bunch of people. So. Working with a uh, co-commentator, and again I come back to my change of role, because I made it very clear that uh, there was only one guy I was interested in working with as a co-commentator, and that was David Miller. And it, his retirement, his forced retirement, coincided with my change of role. And that kind of worked for me, because I knew that Miller, who has been my entire education in the Tour de France, in cycling, from the very first day I ever went to a bike race, where he slipped his chain and yellow jumper and should have won the pro you know and all that that yeah. was David Miller mm. a year later he was busted you know two years okay all oh, right doping right what's that all about <laughs> right then coming back from doping and the anti-doping and the, the trying to race and win clean then the formation of Team Sky and him being on the outside and then retirement I've seen the whole entire arc of a career for better or worse played out with him now working alongside him as a co-commentator one of the things that he's taught me to do is watch a bike race actually watch a bike for the first time now i'm watching a bike race i've spent decades watching a, i thought watching a bike race but until you have to call it i'm now watching it in high definition in a way that so if you if you think of a classic moto 2 shot at the front of the peloton 80 kilometers out um sky on the front for the sake of argument could be quick step whoever with one or two riders on the front you know like a julian van mott doing that endlessly long shift now i've stopped looking at julian van mott because what I'm interested in now is in what Katusha are doing, you know, uh, seven or eight wheels down. Why they've suddenly sent two riders up just to sit on the wheels of... Do you know what? Because that's where the race is happening. And why are you just seeing Team Lotto and El Yumbo moving to the back? Like, why have they... Hang on. What are those four riders just dropping off the back for? And that's where the race is actually yeah. happening. And all of that passed me by before. I just wasn't watching it. I realised I wasn't watching it. And in your defence, I would say that as someone who's had to um, do a report on it uh, on location as well, it is incredibly difficult to <laughs> fit in any bike race watching while you're doing TV. I mean, I always find myself at a massive disadvantage from anyone watching at home because they are sat in front of the sofa listening to an interpretation of the race for hours, whereas you have been running around like a headless chicken yeah. trying to film links, yeah. trying to organize things, trying to get lunch, trying to go to the toilet. Yeah. And actually, you don't get to watch very much of a bike race when you're at a race. You are, all right, when you and I both worked on the finish line at the Tour de France, you are uniquely disadvantaged. <laughs> like, the entire cycling world is better informed than you. <laughs> and at that given moment, you're the one with the microphone who has to ask the, 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 the cogent question. And no one is wor worse informed than you. It's remarkable, isn't it? But what are the sporting events? So quite often, you'll have experienced this. You'll, you'll, ask, um, you'll ask a rider who you're interviewing who's not won the race or done anything but, but you're just interviewing them anyway and you're throwing a question about the winner mm -hmm. and they'll go oh did he win I don't know <laughs> yeah. and they've taken a part in a sporting event that they a don't know the outcome of mm. and b don't care because mm. if it isn't their teammate why, why are they bothered 
And it's like so someone Mark Cavendish. Watched him win, they've been on their bikes. They haven't. They <laughs> haven't got the faintest idea what's <laughs> yeah. happening. You know, and you'll ask um, Cavendish, what happened when? Did you see so and so? You know, a, a classic example is when you ask. When I've seen this, I've, a mistake I no longer make. I hesitate, <laughs> to, but I've seen people do it, and when I see them do it, I go, no, this isn't going to end well. <laughs> a mountain stage, <laughs> and you're interviewing Mark Cavendish mm. about Chris Froome's attack, <laughs> yeah. and he'll look at you witheringly and go, what? Because what? You, yeah, they're not in the same race. So why would he give us stuff? You know, and he won't. He doesn't know. You know. So, uh, yeah. But I mean, it's nuts, isn't it? Cycling. That that there's so much ignorance, about, and so much of what happens in a bike race, even when it's as well covered as the Tour de France, is just below the waterline. You just don't know what's gone on because the cameras have missed it, and you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, you're right. And even I'm very conscious, even when I'm commentating that there are people at home who are better informed than me mm. even though I've got a laptop open I've got mm. connection to the internet I've got a monitor I'm still just watching the telly mm. like everyone else is but I am also charged with um, talking all the time and broadcasting pretty much all the time so it's kind of I can't just say hold on a minute just give me five minutes here <laughs> yeah. while just I research your fact no, just let me think <laughs> Right, everyone just stop <laughs> stop what you're doing because something quite complicated has gone on and I need to just find <laughs> out this thing all right so just bear with me. <laughs> like that. Well, but, but people at home are doing that because they're not commentating. And they are picking up on the, the smallest mistake. And listen, mistakes are absolutely inevitable. You've got the 198 different biographies, yeah. different Palmares, different things and like that. And it's all happening in the blink of an eye with a wobbly camera shot. You know, and nah, that's, you're never going to be perfect for that. You do your best. Did you have stock questions and thinking back to the, the finish line yeah. when you've no idea what's happened? Yes, As you yes. say, you're the person with the microphone. You know everyone at home <laughs> has their burning question to ask and you're uh, thinking, all... oh God, <laughs> let me just say something coherent. Did you have stock questions when what's you have no idea? What's a race? <laughs> <laughs> or if he's an you. Italian, or if he's an Italian in the mix zone. <laughs> Una bella vittoria. Una bella, bella vittoria. Except, except, no. if you're doing that to Mark Cavendish, yeah gives you that withering look oh, again well, because yeah. he expects a question yeah. not a statement yes yes that's so, right yeah. so you can't even get away with yeah. the generic yeah. generic yeah. statement I, in the latter years the Cavendish they started winning in 2008 I was fortunate in that I used to just interview him when he'd won <laughs> which is okay it was okay because mm. you could he'd won, he'd won and he'd do his usual thing about thanking his teammates and then going through a you know, minute detail the last couple of kilometers and all that sort of thing. So it was all like, it was always okay. Matt, Re we used to say Matt Rendell to go and interview when he lost. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so I got away with that. But um, I, I, remember, I remember all in 2003, my first, I wrote about it actually in the Yellow Jumper book, my first Tour de France. There was a stage into Marseille where um, uh, a breakaway of two stayed away. And I can't remember who the other guy was, but there was a Danish, um, uh, ruler for um, a CSC team called Jakob Pili. It was a track racer, really, but he was, he was just making up the numbers. And uh, he and an Italian rider, I think, um, suddenly, with about sort of two or three k to go, realised they had a big enough advantage. Sat up. That is it's quite weird, actually. It's the same finish line up the Avenue du Pardo near the Stade Velodrome as we used on the. Um, and they sat up shook hands and then had a sprint like that <laughs> it was quite nice quite, I remember yeah. it was quite clearly but we were all because it's just one of those sleepy days it's 35 degrees and, and back in those days it really was the finish line was just unrestricted chaos all the camera crews were in one great big clump waiting for these two riders to come in and then there was going to be a 10 minute gap until the peloton came in with Armstrong and everyone else so anyway this guy Jakob Pil won this two up sprint and came hurtling over the finish line and stopped <laughs> right in front of me I mean literally right in front of me at that point, right, uh, the entire swarm of, the, of media just came <laughs> like that and just, just like bunched around me. And because Jakob Pil and Fate had chosen me, <laughs> like that, everybody, and there was no Danish broadcaster there who we would have otherwise deferred to, the entire media circus of the Tour de France, on my first Tour de France, deferred to me <laughs> to ask Jakob Pil the, the, the question, right. And I felt enormous pressure and I could hear in my ear our director because he could see from the finish line camera from French television what was happening and they were just killing themselves in the truck <laughs> waiting for my go on what are you going to ask him Ned and he took his helmet off and he looked me in the eye and everyone looked at me and I just went Jacob you won <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought in the absolute absurdity of this I had no idea what he said and everyone just looked at me like who is this idiot 
And I remember the next day, Jakob Peel, I remember just catching a glimpse of him wandering around his hotel, because we were there to, you know, saying it's the same hotel as Jan Ulrich and the T-Mobile team. And I, th I looked at this guy and I went, Christ, I recognise him, who's he? <laughs> like that. And someone said, isn't that the bloke who won yesterday? <laughs> I went, yeah, what was his name? <laughs> And he was a, a total chip paper. Mm. Like he was suddenly the center of the sporting universe for like 30 seconds. And then the following day, no one could remember that Jakob Peel had won the stage into Marseille. Isn't that <laughs> what's so difficult as well though, about broadcasting in cycling, or is it just me in a terrible memory? But if you go from football, for example, which was your sport to begin yeah. with, there's a team who wins and a team who loses. Yeah. And there are 11 players on a pitch, uh, on one team, obviously, yeah. 22 altogether. With cycling, You've got a spotlight shone on so many different stories on any one given day that become huge. And then the next day it moves on and it's something different and it's a new location and it's a new mountain. And, and, and you've got the 198 riders going with it. To be able to have that frame of reference whereby you're going back and remembering what one rider did or and, and putting things into historical context, I, I find incredibly different, difficult yeah. in cycling. Is, yeah. Is, is, yeah. is that just me? No, no, it isn't just you. I mean, it's it's infinitely detailed, isn't it? And uh, you know, you can't, you can never, you can never know everything. So you know, you know what interests you. You look for the stuff that interests you. I mean, it is interesting when you're when you're coming to do. I mean, I do a lot of commentary for Italian races throughout the year, like Tirreno Adriatico, the Tour of the Alps, it used to be called Trentino. And often the start list there is packed with, um, you know, Italian pro continental teams. And I know like two or three quite well of the riders might be four or five I've literally never heard of so you do what research you can on the internet and you look at that and they, they are kind of young riders just starting out or they're journeymen and you kind of look at you look at their results down the years and it is next to meaningless because they you know you just look at what they've achieved every year they all right they took part in that race and they finished 123rd 86th 57th 89 what does this guy do <laughs> You know, what, am what, how am I going to... So when he gets in a breakaway, what can I say about him? <laughs> He's a person who finishes 89th normally. <laughs> and he comes from Milan. Um, but, you know, there will be a story there, but it's not that. So, you know, the, the, for, for, for nine, nine tenths of the time, 99% of the peloton is anonymous. It, it's like you say, they're just kind of like there, they roll over, they do their job, they catch their paycheck at the end of the, mm. you know, it, what a bizarre sport. You know, <laughs> yeah. you're so right. It's, um, it's just uh, breathtaking, the detail. Yeah. You mentioned the chaos of, of um, the TV side of things back in the day when you started. How have you seen the media circus grow, <coughs> or change, evolve or not since you started, would you say? Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it has changed dramatically and I have to say not for the better. Um, I think that, I, I, you know, I might have misremembered this, but I think when I first started the only Tour de France team to have a press officer, and he wasn't really a press officer, he was just a bloke, was obviously Armstrong's team. He was normally, he was a guy called Yogi Muller, I think, and he used to be, his primary job was to take pictures of the media so that they could pour over the pictures later and Armstrong could point at certain faces and go him, not him, him and not him. Um, and then, you know, they had Serge, his bodyguard. And every other rider in the peloton was up for grabs. You know, you could just grab them in a hotel, at the finish line, on the start, wherever you wanted to. It was all, access all areas. Knock on hotel room doors, used to do that. <clears throat> Obviously, the days of the you know the list being you know you know occasionally teams still do that don't they? The, the, yeah. You kind of laugh at them when they do you know <laughs> Fortuna Oscardo, what are you doing? You know, oh, you're doing that because no one wants to interview Bruce yeah, for you, exactly. so it's it doesn't really matter. You know, there's something quite, quite sweet about that. But you know, even even US Postal used to do that back in the day, and certainly, you know, the, the days of oh, I can't remember last time I saw a rider in the Start Village. That's a shame, mm -hmm. and it used to be commonplace. I remember. It, I remember Bradley Wiggins, you know, regularly going getting haircuts in 2006, 2007 at the Start Village. Uh, Miller always used to be there reading his newspaper, you know, pipe, <laughs> <laughs> cap of some description, you know, of probably wearing jodhpurs, <laughs> um, bicycle clips. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so that's 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 changed. I don't think that's brilliant, is it? Because now, now you have question. You know, you're told that it's it's. It's become like football. You, to some extent, you know. Okay, so Dave is coming out. Uh, don't ask him about this. Sorry, you could you don't avoid. Don't. I mean, you must have had that. Mm. This is off. This is off. Out of bounds today. Yeah, yeah. Is it? 
And you just have to suck it up, don't you? Because if you say no, it's not, you, you won't get the interview. Uh, Sky particularly controlling, but they're not alone. I mean, I think there are other teams that are equally bad. And every rider now, because the buses are so luxurious, every rider, and, and, and it's a self-perpetuating thing, because they look at their senior riders and they, the younger riders are impressionable and do what the senior riders do. Um, because the senior mm. riders don't go out until the last mm. minute and avoid doing as many interviews, you know, get away with as few as they possibly can, or none, ideally. That's what the younger riders have learned, that kind of behaviour. So all the riders pile out of the buses to sign on at the very last minute. So if you go to the start, head of a big... I mean, they don't do this job anymore, Daniel Freib does on the ITV thing, but if you, you, you know, your producer says, get, have a word with Contador, get Nibali, get um, Chavez and get Froome, you can't. Mm. You used to be able to, mm. because you used to get, you know, just go and knock on the, du- the <laughs> door of the bus and sort of say, yeah, you can have a word with him. And now you can't, you'll have to decide which of the one you, you prioritise and then hope you get him. Um, and and it's become, and the other, f- you know, major difference is it's become English speaking. And that's been very, very quick. And, uh, and, and so I suppose it should be something for an English speaking audience I shouldn't begrudge and, and we should celebrate because gives us a better idea maybe if we're not blessed with foreign you speak languages most most of the journalists speak language I've always been quite impressed with that actually in the, in the cycling coverage but for the audience who maybe don't have the languages maybe it's nice to hear these riders speak in, in English but for me I, th- I think it's um it just takes something it takes on some of the romance away from the event you know uh, that's changed a lot yeah when you say about about the relationship and the growth, I guess, of, of, of press officers, so the relationship that's changed between us and the teams, I guess they would say that that is something that's necessitated <coughs> by an increase in professionalism for a start. Um, it's become, it has become more global, it's become bigger. There are more of us on the, on the um, journalist side of things and that they would say they need to control it. I mean, I remember trying to get a shot of Richie Port warming up for the time trial uh, at the start of this year's Tour de France and we went over towards the team bus and we were told no 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 um, your slot for filming him was 10 minutes ago and I'm like well, there's a slot for filming someone in a public car park I didn't realise I didn't get that particular yeah. Um, yeah. carrier pigeon message yeah. I've, I assumed we could film whenever we wanted Yeah. but that's their way they would say of, of Richie concentrating and not being distracted is there an answer to that you know is there or, or is it just has it just become a, a beast of its own making really where it's fed into itself and now well yes of course we are going to be extra frantic because you're only giving us 10 minutes so then we will be a distraction to Richie Port as he's warming up and you will need to control that and it becomes self-fulfilling well I mean you'd have to ask the riders wouldn't you you know I'm not I'm not I'm not well enough placed but I mean no. the problem is no rider is going to say I think you should have more access <laughs> you know that's that's not going to happen but whether but it is it's self-perpetuating isn't it and they look at each other and they they look at you know and I have to say Team Sky are right at the forefront of this because they were the they were the people who turned up and put the screens up you know at, at, in front of you talk about warming up for time trials they were the ones who invented that kind of um, exclusion zone they've set the tone and everyone else has followed um it's hard to argue against because, of course, they're trying to protect their riders. Does it make for a better product? No. No. I mean, you know, if we're, t- if we're in the entertainment business, which they are, um, they are removing themselves from the public step by step and bit by bit, you know. Do you think they realise the danger of that at this stage because footballers, again, to go back to that sport, can afford to remove themselves yeah. from the public because they are so huge and yeah. there is so much money and, and attention on them anyway? Cycling doesn't have that luxury, does it? Well, so, some cycling doesn't. You know, I mean, the thing is, Team Sky, Team Sky, I'm sorry to go on and on about them, but, <laughs> but it is, they, they do happen to win the Grand Tours a lot and they do happen to win the big one more than anyone else. Um, they don't really care because their sponsor is only interested in winning the Tour de France and nothing, else, everything else is secondary and they do that very well so they can sacrifice everything else to that altar. Um, but if you drop down to, you know, if you drop down to, if you like slightly needier sponsors, you know, like, let's, let's go right down to um, uh, Wanty Group Gobert. I don't even know what Wanty Group do, do you know? <laughs> no, I have no, no I idea know. actually. I don't know, but I would imagine they would be enormously amenable to you, kind of like, if they'd be so flattered if you mm. turned up and said I want to do something amazing with Frederick Backett I want to have breakfast with Frederick <laughs> Backett and talk to him Maybe about we should. yeah you know um, and so and so it's interesting isn't it so some some it's the cart before the horse and the horse before the cart some of the 
lesser teams. You can drop right down to continental domestic. I do a lot of kind of domestic cycling in the UK. Have done for for years. And there, the sponsors couldn't be more helpful and happy, and they're, they're just interested in exposure. And that's the old cycling model, isn't it? Where that's why they're in it. Mm. So they're trying to maximise their, you know. Um, but Sky don't need that, I don't think. So, but they're, you know, I don't, I don't know what the I don't know what the answer is, but I do know it's changed. Um, and and the, the, it was a rough. When I started off, it was a rough and ready place. That the um, mixed zone, as it was, I mean, there must have been barriers there, like cattle herding barriers that there are now. But I, if there were, I can't really remember them. It didn't feel like that. It felt like every day we were in the middle of the most almighty rugby scrum, you know. And um, and there was no bigger, there was no bigger name in world sport, not in cycling, in world sport than Lance Armstrong at the time, and he was, you know, at the centre of this firestorm. And it wasn't, there was this perception as well that, you know, in the years of kind of those tainted years of Omata and, and um, no one daring to upset the apple cart, there's a lot of truth to that. But it wasn't always that way and people did challenge Armstrong repeatedly. And so it was, could be a feisty place where difficult questions were asked and dealt with and answered and people fell out and words were exchanged. And and actually, I know I, I ridicule him and everything, well, I don't ridicule him for but I, I know I poke fun at Mark Cavendish's moodiness, but Cavendish has a bit of that combativity that I think, you know, he, he might be the last of the angry mm. riders <laughs> to some extent, you know. Um, and it needs a bit of that. It needs a bit of that. What? He doesn't, he doesn't care about his PR, does he? I mean, he does, he does on the one hand. He does, he does. I mean, he cares massively about his image, Man, yeah. but he's incapable of kind of manipulating himself to do the right thing, really, because, <laughs> it, because the, the chimp will out, you know. Which is what's wonderful. I think yeah. he cares, as you say, massively about his image, yeah. but his fire takes over he yeah. can't help he it he can't, can't help control himself, himself. Can't, yeah can't the chips out himself. of the cage before he can yeah. even find the key i mean you've seen repeatedly press officers who've worked with mark <laughs> just just give up haven't you they just <laughs> yeah. go oh whatever because <laughs> whatever happens here i'm gonna get it <laughs> yeah yeah uh, you know i had his press officer at was agent um in rio uh say to me i'm going to stop have to stop you from doing interviews with him orla because he gets too relaxed he just lets go and i yeah. can't control him and i'm like well yeah that's the beauty of it thank you very much but um what is it then that, that sucked you in about cycling to begin with? It was a sport that you had no idea about. Um, That's beautiful. You, fi you, you find your passion through work, like me, and I've got my own theories as to what makes it so attractive to an outsider, right. but what, what was it for you? I mean, it's, be it's beautiful because, um, because the stadium is the open road and that open road can be the you know, first bike race I ever saw. I think started, I think it started, I think I'm, I think I'm right in saying it started near the Palais Royal, crossed the River Seine, um, took in the, Arc de Tri uh, the um, Eiffel Tower and finished alongside the Invalides. You know, that's I mean, quite a first race. That's OK. That's, that's <laughs> where this sporting event is happening, you know. Um, and the next day, I think, produced the most almighty pile up in a bunch sprint I've ever seen where Jimmy Casper lost half his arse. And I thought, OK, so that was, yesterday was beautiful and dramatic. Today's just unbelievably savage. And you're gonna you can carry on tomorrow with half an arse. It blew my <laughs> mind. It blew my mind. Um, and I remember seeing him. I remember seeing that even like day two of my experience of cycling. This French rider who I'd never heard of. Funnily enough, I, I had dinner with him on the Tour de France this year because he he rides the um, motorbike that hands out the oh, yeah. Vitel bottles. The, <laughs> anyway, Jimmy Casper and I was reminding him of the day he lost half his arse and he didn't need remind or want reminding. <laughs> but I remember he was doing an interview live on French television that evening with like half his ass hanging off <laughs> and like, like little bits of swab and bandage just kind of ever so gingerly placed over this open wound. And I'd assumed he should have been in hospital. He started and he finished that Tour de France, I think. What else do I need to say? It was so different from any, any other sport I'd ever covered, any experience I'd ever had. Um, and that was just the beginning. And then, and then, then I started to concentrate on the race and um, and then, you know, even a, even a kind of like basic understanding of the tactics and wh what is actually happening, it's just beautiful. <laughs> it's just an insanely uh, engrossing feast for the eyes, isn't it? And then to actually be able to rub shoulders with these people in their hyper normality. Mm -hmm. You see them doing these extraordinary things and then you meet them and they're just blokes. You know, they're just really normal. And there's, he's just having, and you're in the same hotel and he's just sitting there eating his cornflakes, about to go and race up an alp. I, um, yeah. 
just incredible. Because they say never to get close to your heroes, yeah. and, and maybe hero even is the wrong word. We were talking earlier about whether riding at Herne Hill demystified in any way the romance of it. But is there an element of actually seeing that hypernormality, as you as you call it? Does that actually help to mythologize it even more so? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. I mean, it does. I kind of um, they are. I think. I think they're tremendous. Even the you know, even perhaps the least articulate rider is able, to my mind, to articulate the grandeur of their sport. Uh, even like an Ian Stannard, bless him. He's just a lovely, kind of honest, straightforward bloke. But even he, even he, when you kind of like see those shots of him coming over the line, he takes off and he's losing all his hair now, bless him, isn't he? Kind of like the <laughs> helmet comes off and he's got mud all over his face and you can see it in his eye. And he, even though he's not blessed with the widest vocabulary, when he says stuff in the heat at the moment, you kind of go, yeah, 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 no, I can totally see what you've, I can, I can see what you've been through. I'm a million miles away from it, but I get it. I get it. And... Um, there's no one more normal in the world than Ian Stannard, but what he does is completely abnormal, and it's that kind of um, that extraordinary disparity between the, the two halves of their lives that is um, beguiling, I think. You know. And you mentioned that heat of the moment, which is still something that we are blessed with being able to be a part of in cycling, compared to other more um, structured sports where they're in a certain arena and you and you're kept your distance. We do get to shove a microphone in, in faces in the most brutal moments of suffering or ju mm. immediately afterwards. I guess recently I've been struck by um, social media interpretations of those heat of the moment statements and, and I find, I, I, I'm just interested to know what you think about social media and, that, and how that's affected our relationship with riders and teams in the sport because it feels like we want our riders to be raw and pure and honest and yet they can be pulled apart when they speak from the heart in the moment, but what else? What What's the alternative? Yeah, you're you're very right. I mean, there are very few exceptions. Riders do look at social media, I think, and they upset. Some of them obsess over it, and uh, I think they're right to be very very wary of it because it's a it's a bear pit. I mean, I'm not a rider. I'm a I'm a you know broadcaster and a writer, occasionally a journalist. I'm in that kind of camp. But I, I, do, I very rarely express an opinion on controversies that rage around the social media because I have opinions, but that's not the forum I'm going to even kind of know. Because you can't, everyone just, everyone just lines up and screams at each other. It's an insane place for, it's not the place for rational debate. You know, face to face, talking things through, that's the place to, you know, where you've got, you can't put yourself in someone else's shoes in social media. You just have to line up one way or the other. And it does my head in, and I, I, I completely get what you're saying. I would be, like, we just had a really great example on the Vuelta, haven't we? If on the rest day, Nikki Terpstra said something quite daft on Instagram. You know, it was a little bit, there was a little hint of kind of like disrespectful, possibly, you know, European racism attached to it. Just a sniff of that that was a bit uncomfortable. There was a bad joke about terrorism attached to it. Um, where he called the Colombian team Manza Posta bomb when he was getting on a plane. Let's just leave it at that. It wasn't a particularly funny joke, but it wasn't the worst thing in the world. Oh my God, the moral guardians of our online universe, you know, just jumped on him. And um, so he ain't gonna be posting anything remotely in inverted commas amusing anytime soon on in the internet, is he? So that we've lost another kind of spark of interest there. It was a bloody stupid thing to say, but honestly, that's all it was. Because it was lovely to begin with, I find, with social media, that, that you did feel like we're talking about the press officers. We had a direct access to the riders and we could hear their thoughts. And, and you know, this is common across all sports and all walks of life. Yeah. I remember when, when Bradley Wiggins was um, considering leaving Garmin and going to Team Sky, yeah. or, or he wasn't considering it as far as the public were aware. He was denying it, but then, <laughs> then tweeted that he'd gone to the beach because he had serious thinking to do. Yeah. And that caused a whole storm yeah. amongst the teams. They're saying, what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, letting people know that you're considering moving teams. And of course, Bradley Wiggins doesn't tweet anymore. And Mark Cavendish doesn't really tweet anymore. And all these people who were yeah. wonderful firecrackers on social yeah. media just aren't there anymore. I mean, that's almost a shame that we've got this huge deafening arena of noise from a camp uh, of of Twitter warriors and not so much from people we want to hear from, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, what you're forgetting is Kath Wiggins and Michelle. Oh, yeah. And Latu Swear, which was probably Twitter's apotheosis. <laughs> they should have just packed the social media, the network up, so we can't do better than that. 
it was when Peter Cavendish came in and went, what, both of you, just what did she say? Just go and sort this out with handbags or something like that. Something like that, just yeah, Just diffused, yeah. came in brilliantly and won, won that, you know, hands down. Um, no, you're right, you're right. Um, you're, you're, you're right. Well, I mean, all I can say, all I can say is, um, what hasn't changed, you know, is the reality of what motivates these riders, um, what, 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 what drives their lives, what, um, what frustrates them, what angers them and all that sort of thing. That's all still there and all I, can, all I can say is instead of sitting on your ass, you know, kind of like trawling Twitter and watching bike racing from afar, get stuck in mm-hmm. and the next time a bike race is anywhere near your hometown or you can get there, just go and, go, go and meet these people up close and personal. Don't go, if you go to the Tour de France, don't go to a finish line because you won't see anything really go to a start village mm. and don't go and wait outside the um, team sky bus for a, so you can be one of the 200 people there shouting through me into the <laughs> ether go pick pick the smallest rider on the smallest mm. to pick Zach Dempster <laughs> and go and um, and go and just shake his hand and wish him all the best and ask him how yesterday was and then you'll get a flavor of what bike racing is all about you know and you, those people are still there and they're still real and they still will be flattered that the attention and the respect that you show them because my god it's a hard profession you know it is most of the time it's just a shitty job for most of the riders <laughs> and it's honestly it's not particularly well rewarded for most of the riders either um it's just it's just a hard shitty job and every day i, I turn when i'm commentating turn to david and say wish you were out there and he just goes no and especially when it comes to time trialing which is his discipline I, I turned to him, we were commentating on a time trial yesterday on the Vuelta and I said, you used to do this for a living. And he went, what the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> so how do you find uh, the commentating side of it? It's so very different in terms of a, of a daily yeah. job compared to the reporting. The reporting, you're running around, you're in the field, you're in the thick of it. Your job is to, to give us as viewers access to the writers and the yeah. stories. And now you are that level removed like the viewers yeah. and are not necessarily in yeah. the action. Yeah. Although I have to say, you since you started commentating, I still see you at the um, uh, the team presentations, for example, at the start of the Tour de France where we're all heralded yeah, yeah, into the yeah, media yeah, yeah, pen yeah. and we get our little yeah. chance to chat to the riders. Yeah. You're still there without a microphone, without a, oh, without no, a camera, yeah, yeah. but just there sort of sucking it all up. Yeah, and yeah. and yeah. I saw you this year and just thought you looked you looked like a like a little boy full of wonder <laughs> looking at these at these riders and and eavesdropping is what they were saying. You still love that. So there's a few things there. One is um one is I'm looking at I'm looking at riders' kneecaps. And I'm looking kneecaps, kneecaps and elbows. <laughs> hair sideburns <laughs> earrings tattoos i'm going who are you you can't honestly because identifying riders is so so central to so i'm looking for distinctive little marks that have you ever identified a rider in the peloton by his kneecaps possibly not kneecaps but elbows most certainly yeah yeah um all that sort of thing it's just so that's part of what i'm doing and the other thing all of that's really really important in my job and it comes back to this kind of like the fans know better thing is that um you can research a rider who you don't know personally. Some riders I know personally, many, 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 I don't. Um, but, you know, most of the time, the, the, uh, you're drawing down information that's freely accessible to everybody in the world, right? So how do you make that distinctive, how do you kind of impart distinctive and exclusive knowledge? There's only one way, and that's to grab the rider, introduce yourself and talk.